Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you. Are you all ready comparing this year to last year? We'll look back at 2012 and see what you remember. Instead of gardening, the beauty of flowers. Take a closer look and see another world you have been missing. Our first feature story today is about a Tunica, Mississippi catfish farm and processor for whom flavor isn't a buzzword. Bill Battle operates a state-of-the-art processing plant that's designed to do one thing, produce on-flavored fish. We don't feel like the imported, any of the imported fish meets our quality standard. Uh, we feel like we've got a far superior product to, to, to any foreign product that, that wants to compare with us, and we'll compare any day, any time. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Our first story today takes us to Tunica, Mississippi, where flavor is one business's top priority. Leighton, in the farm-raised catfish business, taste is everything. Processors begin taste testing fish months before they're harvested. The whole industry gets a black eye when off-flavor catfish are sold to the public regardless of where they're grown. One Northwest Mississippi catfish farmer and processor is so concerned about taste it's the company's sole focus. Certified on flavor is the company slogan of Pride of the Pond of Tunica. Owner Bill Battle says that the focus has on flavor has kept it in business at a time when others have gone out. That's what's going to determine whether we stay in business or not is, is our quality and, and our service. And, and uh, that's what we want to compete on. On flavor catfish that's treated properly is by far better than any fish I've ever eaten. Flavor and taste are practically obsessions for owner Bill Battle and Pride of the Pond, a Tunica, Mississippi catfish processor. Pride of the Pond is the processing and sales division of Battle Farms. Battle's father and mother, Paul and Norma, began catfish farming in 1969. We started raising fish and, and uh, uh, the live haulers would, would take fish to pay lakes up north. And we were about 100 miles closer than any other fish that they could get in, in Mississippi. So, uh, so we had a little edge on the market, and, and that, that market grew. Looking for an edge turned out to be a way of business for the battles. There was no live haul market during the winter, so in 1982, Bill's father decided to add value to his fish by building a processing plant with the Owen family and Bill Gidden. Around 2008, Battle Farms bought out their partners and became the sole owner. At this time, Battle renovated the Pride of the Pond plant. Battle and his staff believe their modernization has improved further the flavor and quality of their catfish. The catfish are transported in chilled water and processed in a plant kept at 43 degrees. In an hour after harvest, the catfish are either fresh packed on ice or frozen, ready for the customer. Our flavor profile is, is one of the best uh, in the industry. It's uh, the way we process our, our product. Uh, it's cold from swimming fish. Uh, it's chilled to, to when it's frozen or ice packed. Uh, you know, when you can do that within an hour, uh, your product is fresh. You have a longer shelf life from fresh and the frozen. The profit margins are slim in catfish processing, so efficiency is vital. Even though it processes 55,000 pounds of catfish per day, Battle says prior to the pond is probably the smallest modern plant in the industry. Computer automated scales weigh the product at several points in the process, as well as sort the catfish fillets according to weight. Battle admits much of his plant's redesign came from ideas he saw in the poultry processing industry. The chicken people, uh seem to be a little more advanced than the catfish people as far as product flow and, and uh, how to not double handle material. And, and so we took their advice and went through several plans before we 
decided on Final Flame, and, and we're real happy with what we got. There's an electronic scoreboard on the wall that ranks the employees trimming the catfish fillets. It's updated constantly by the computer weighing system. Trimmers who perform well get a bonus. That's another thing that came from the chicken industry. Uh, they have to do a lot of trimming of chickens, and, and they said that if you put a little bit of competitive edge between your trimmers, it, it kind of breaks the boredom of repetitive work and uh, gives them an incentive to, to do more. Everybody wants to be the number one trimmer. The effort to deliver on flavored catfish extends to the Battle Farms catfish operation. 98% of Pride of the Ponds catfish comes from Battle's own 2,700 acres of ponds, allowing him once again more control over fish quality. All flavored catfish may taste or smell musty or muddy. It is usually caused by certain types of blue-green algae. The fish are safe to eat, just undesirable. If it hadn't been testing good or, a, or a, a slightly off, we'll make sure that once it hits that good level that it's maintained for several weeks before we do bring it in. Not only that, they can, they can hold fish that they know are our own flavor for during periods of the year when a lot of the fish, maybe as high as 80 percent of the fish that are out there, are off flavor. So they can kind of sock away a few fish there they know are good quality. So when, those t when things get lean out there, they've got a good solid product they can go and pull from their own farm. We're going to be 100% on flavor 100% uh, of the time. Mississippi has always had more than half of all the farm-raised catfish water acres in the United States, but acres peaked in Mississippi 12 years ago at almost 113,000. In early 2013, it had dropped by more than half to just under 49,000 acres. Most of this decline has occurred since the Great Recession started in late 2007. Several factors have combined to hammer U.S. catfish producers. U.S. catfish producers overproduced and pond acres plummeted. This caused a shortage in record high pond bank prices in 2011. These were met with record high feed prices due to high grain and soybean prices. Some areas saw feed increase to $562 per ton in 2012. Back when feed was uh, even at $200 a ton, even back then it was estimated that feed was as much as probably 60% of our annual operating cost. Now with the cost of feeds, you know, that number is probably up as high as 80 to 90% of our operating, annual operating cost. The increase in pond bank prices has prompted overseas producers of catfish-like species to flood the U.S. market. Imports of catfish account for 78% of all catfish fillets sold in the United States. Imports are also the cheapest catfish, pulling down the price of U.S. grown stock. And, and the price of live fish followed that shortage and went up 50% during that time period. Well, at the same time, the Vietnamese and the other imported products that come over here at considerably less selling price just found a perfect storm for them to come into and get into a market that was short on fish in supply and, and at record price levels. The U.S. catfish industry points out foreign-produced catfish are often grown using drugs and chemicals that are banned in the United States. The catfish industry says in 2012, 45 shipments of foreign catfish were not allowed entry into the U.S. Unfortunately, only a small percentage of foreign-grown seafood is inspected each year. We don't feel like the imported, any of the imported fish meets our quality standard. Uh, we feel like we've got a far superior product to, to, to any foreign product that, that wants to compare with us, and we'll compare any day, any time. In spite of the situation facing the U.S. catfish industry, Battlefields Pride of the Pond's focus on flavor, efficiency, and customer service will help it meet the challenges of the future. We do everything that we can do to deliver the best product that we possibly can to the cook. And once it gets to the cook's hands, it's not much I can do. <laughs> and you can watch his story on Pride of the Pond again on our Farm Week uh, webpage, Facebook page, or YouTube. Website address is farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have the links and contact information so you can get in touch with Pride of the Pond. It has a web page and a Facebook page. I think everyone does now. Uh, private individuals can buy direct from the plant if they wish. Once again, that's farmweek.msucares.com and there, prideofthepond.com as well. Leighton, I 
in an update on that story, a talk with Billy Mohead, uh, and he said that right now the retail segment, which is grocery stores, is really tough for the processors right now, that the retail side of the market is going towards the imported fish. Uh, regardless, I guess, of what the quality might be, they are going towards it because of the price. And, they, and of course, their, their fish, they're trying to meet that price. Of course, they're raised under a lot stricter standards. So uh, he said it's still rough in the business right now. Uh, he said there are some catfish farmers having to cut back on their inventory. Well, that means a little less fish, perhaps, on flavor that you're competing for as well. So, you know, being kind of whipsaw in there, you know, between lower supplies right. and yet can't bump that price up to be able to buy the fish that are, you know, so. Uh, but he says, hey, we're going to hang in there, you know, and still going to produce the on flavor fish. Thanks, Artis. Good story. Well, time now for our trivia quiz on Farm Week. And uh, this week it's about trees and how they help clean our air. And do you know how clean? Well, here's the question. How much dust and gases will an acre of trees remove from the surrounding environment? The answer is one of these, one ton, two and a half tons, six and a half tons, or 13 tons. We'll have the answer right after today's Southern Gardening segment. Well, have you really taken the time to look at flowers? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman says the beauty of flowers can be appreciated on many different levels. horticulturist means I really enjoy plants. Let's take a close look at some of the marvelous flowers found in our landscapes and gardens. In an earlier Southern Gardening segment, we enjoyed the delicate blue flowers of the aptly named blue butterfly plant. In this segment, I would like to share some other interesting flowers. One of the most unique flowers I know belongs to the Mississippi Medallion winner yellow shrimp plant and the related red shrimp plant. The plant begins blooming by sending up colorful four to five inch spikes, which are very long lasting. Many think this is the flower, but in reality it is a modified flower called a bract. The flowers are the white tubular structures that emerge from the bract. Another plant having interesting flowers is Terenia, commonly called wishbone flower. The stamens, which contain the yellow pollen grains, form a structure that resembles a wishbone. Bees enter the flower in search of nectar and pick up and transfer the pollen. Perhaps the most interesting flowers belong to the container and basket plant favorite, begonia. Begonia are monoecious plants, which have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. The four petal male flowers have numerous stamens containing the pollen. The five petal female flowers have two to four twisted structures called stigma, which receive the pollen grains. We all enjoy the flowering plants in our landscapes, but taking a closer look reveals an entirely different perspective on the beauty of flowers. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says there's a lot to be learned about your flowers and with more knowledge, you will have a deeper appreciation. It's time for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. It's about the beneficial way that trees clean our air of dust and gases. And the answer might surprise you. According to the Agriculture Council of America, the answer is D. One acre of trees can remove 13 tons of dust and gases from the surrounding air. We're going to pause now for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. We we'll look back at last year and see what lasting effects that it will have on agriculture far into the future. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. Before we get back to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The annual Rice Field Day will be held Tuesday, July 30th at Stoneville. Registration starts at 2.30 in the afternoon. 
Traders will leave the CAP Center at 340 to tour the research plots. A rice buyer from Mars Incorporated will be the keynote speaker. Mississippi State University's White Sand Unit will hold its summer field day Tuesday, August 13th. It's located 10 miles west of Poplarville on Highway 26. The half-day event starts at 9 a.m. and ends with a sponsored lunch. Participants will tour and see the Summer Forge research plots and how they're coming along. Different herbicide and fertilizer regimes will be on display. We'll also get a chance to uh, test your hay judgment in the annual hay evaluation contest. The White Sand Unit focuses on cow calf production, which is the most common form of beef cow business in Mississippi. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week snapshot. Our last feature story segment today takes us back to last year. We'll be reviewing the year 2012 in agriculture. It was a year marked by drought, but fortunately not in Mississippi. It was also a year that saw major victories by animal rights supporters regarding hog and egg production. Farm Week's Artis Ford reports. Seven. Some would argue the drought in the Midwest and the Plains was the biggest story of 2012, but the story with the farthest reaching consequences may have concerned livestock production. 2012 may be looked upon in the future as a major tipping point. Under pressure from animal rights groups, major pork buyers and major pork suppliers announced various agreements that would end their production of swine housed in gestation crates. Gestation crates are metal enclosures used in intensive hog operations. Each pregnant sow is fed individually and fighting for food between sows is eliminated. The crates, however, do not allow for much movement. Many restaurant chains, including McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Cracker Barrel, Hardee's, Sonic, and Denny's announced they would phase out buying pork from pork producers who use gestation crates. Major pork producers, including Smithfield Foods, the nation's largest, Prestige, Hormel, and Kraft Foods, were among those who announced plans in 2012 to phase out the use of gestation crates. Kroger, the nation's largest grocery chain, and Safeway, the fifth largest, announced their plans to eliminate gestation crates from their supply chain. The way eggs are produced in the United States is also set to change. Major egg producers came to an agreement with the Humane Society of the United States to switch from conventional or so-called battery cages to enriched cages by the year 2029. The two agreed to sponsor the Egg Products Inspection Act of 2012, which is working its way through the Congress. The United Egg Producers, which includes CalMaine, said the joint legislative efforts were pursued to avoid disruption to interstate sales and to develop consistent national standards. Enriched cages have about twice the room per hen than battery cages. They also have different areas where the hens can perch, lay their eggs, and scratch. Livestock producers are concerned what else lies ahead in the future when the animal rights movement seeks to extend its gains. The drought was the national story that dominated the Ag News headlines in 2012. Characterized as the worst widespread drought since the 1950s, it hit the West, the Midwest, the Plains, Missouri, Arkansas, and North Central Georgia. The USDA estimates 80% of the nation's agricultural land and 60% of its farms were affected by the drought. 43% of the nation's farms were said to experience severe to extreme drought. Mississippi escaped the drought for the most part, although conditions were generally drier as you move to the northwest. NASA says global temperatures for 2012 were the ninth warmest in 132 years of record keeping. 2012 was the warmest year on record in the lower 48 states of the U.S., smashing the old record set in 1998. The Weather Channel says 34,000 record highs were set compared to 6,700 record lows. Nine of the warmest years recorded have taken place since the year 2000. Mississippi's row crop farmers had the best of both worlds, good yields and high prices due to the drought. Mississippi set another record for farm production value in 2012, $7.3 billion. Poultry continued its traditional dominance with $2.5 billion, 
34 percent of all Mississippi's farm production value. High prices and high yields helped push Mississippi soybeans past forestry to second place with a record $1.16 billion in farm production value. Forestry posted $1 billion in farm production value, up almost 8 percent from 2011. Mississippi corn came in fourth with a record value of $891 million. Cotton moved down to fifth with $397 million in farm production value. Acres lost to corn production and low prices fueled the downward slide. Cattle and calves saw a 39 percent increase in 2012 to a record $329 million in farm production value. Farm-raised catfish fell to seventh, down 23 percent to $165 million. Competition from imports and high feed prices are still causing farmers to exit the business. Hay came in eighth with a new production value of $145 million. Wheat ninth, $134 million. Rice came in tenth with $130 million in farm production value. In other national news, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced in January its intentions to close 259 offices and laboratories nationwide. After hearings were held, 11 of that number came from Mississippi. The closings did put a tarnish on the USDA's 150th anniversary, which occurred in 2012. It was also the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act, which established land-grant universities in the United States. Mississippi State University was one of the universities picked to honor the occasion in June at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in Washington, D.C. Even though people, less people are working directly in agriculture today, uh, we still serve that mission as well as uh, broaden, broaden the scope of our mission to include benefits to all of, all of society as, as far as economic development, health, uh, youth and families, uh, natural resources. Mississippi's peanut industry expanded in the state with the announcement that the Clint Williams Company of Oklahoma would open buying stations in Greenwood and Clarksdale. Birdsong Peanuts of Georgia invested $3 million in its existing buying station at Aberdeen. There are now three companies buying peanuts in Mississippi. The expansion caused Mississippi's peanut acreage to jump 350 percent to 52,000 in 2012. Average yield per acre was a record 4,400 pounds, with an overall state record crop of almost 216 million pounds. Mississippi soybean farmers harvested a record state average yield of 42 bushels per acre. They planted almost 2 million acres with an overall crop of 82.3 million bushels, worth a record value of more than $1 billion. Mississippi corn farmers harvested a record state average yield of 165 bushels per acre. They planted 820,000 acres for grain and harvested almost 132 million bushels. Mississippi growers were worried that their great corn crop might fall victim to Hurricane Isaac in late August. Farmers rushed to harvest as much as they could before it made landfall. Fortunately, the storm did not cause widespread damage. The first clouds from Hurricane Isaac began to move over Webster County, Mississippi, early Tuesday morning. Grower Stan Rogers of Gore Springs, however, began stepping up his corn harvest schedule several days ago because hurricanes mean lost yield. Said it's supposed to be here Wednesday, and we like about 200 acres. So we, we're working harder trying to get it out. Expected high prices for corn and soybeans caused cotton acreage to go down in Mississippi in 2012. 470,000 acres were planted, down 25 percent from 2011. The state average yield was 970 pounds per acre, with a total crop of 950,000 bales, down 21 percent. Corn and soybeans also stole acres from Mississippi rice in 2012. Farmers harvested a respectable 7,100 pounds per acre in 2012, but they only planted 130,000 acres, the lowest in 35 years. Mississippi cattlemen set a new record for farm production value, $329 million. The drought in other areas and higher prices and a bigger state calf crop helped to set the record. Overall, the number of all cattle and calves declined to 910,000 head at the end of 2012, off 2 percent from a year earlier. High feed prices and imports hurt the Mississippi catfish industry in 2012. Water acres declined to 48,600, off 5 percent from 2011 and their lowest point since the peak in 2001. Mississippi continued to advance its reputation in next generation biofuels. Keor announced in May that it had essentially completed its Columbus, Mississippi plant and would begin the process of bringing it online. Keor uses wood chips to create what it calls renewable crude oil. A plant three times the size of the Columbus one is planned for Natchez. 
A big event was celebrated in early October. Farm Week celebrated its 35th anniversary on the air. Farm Week's first broadcast took place October 3, 1977. More than 1,776 have followed. And you can watch this story again on the year 2012 at our Farm Week website, on our Facebook page, or on the YouTube channel. That website address is farmweek.msucares.com. And try out our Facebook page and give us a like if you wish. Facebook fans see our stories first on Fridays. So again, the year 2012, we saw soybeans move up and catfish and cotton slide down in that production value column. Quite a year. But well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, St. Bethany Fresh. We'll tell you how this Pontotoc area greenhouse tomato operation got its name. This brother and sister combination are operating a state-of-the-art computer control facility. They take great pride in the taste of their tomatoes. In Southern Gardening, the Zahara Zinnia. This tough flower is pretty and it's disease resistant. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.